Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of of the Differentiators. I'm your host Aditya, and I have my co-host uh, Shreyas with me. Uh, our guest for today is uh, Vinod Shankar, who is the co-founder and partner at Java Capital. So prior to this, he worked with uh, K Start, a seed initiative of uh, Kalari Capital, involved in deal sourcing and portfolio management. So he's also been an in angel investor at uh, companies like Daily Ninja, Trell, and Resi. Um, so thanks, Vinod. Thanks for taking your time out. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Aditya, and thanks, Shreyas, for having me. You know, uh, look forward to uh, having a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, my first question is, um, you know, can can you just briefly talk about your journey from from your uh, uh, first company that you worked for till uh, Java Capital? Um, can you just talk us through briefly about that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, let me try to be brief here, given that it's a long journey of 15 plus years. Uh, I think, you know, like most people, right, uh, uh, I call myself a Bangalore boy since, you know, I was born, brought up here, you know, and I studied here, literally didn't travel for anything except for work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been in Bangalore for all along. Uh, uh, like most people, I said, you know, I'm an engineer. I joined a startup pretty early. My first job itself was in a startup in Indranagar. Uh, this is like the early 2000s, 2005, 2006. And that was my first exposure to a startup, you know. My first job was in a startup and I joined that and I got exposed to, you know, what's happening, you know, in terms of venture capital because the company was invested by a bunch of angel investors, venture capital. And this company got sold to a large MNC, you know. And, and, and I got a touch of, you know, all that, you know, pretty early in my uh, career. And that company got acquired by KK and Sequoia at that time. And uh, and, uh, and and that was like a steep uh, learning or, you know, I would say, you know, fortunate learning curve, you know, for my eventual uh, career journeys, you know, in venture capital in some form or other, right? So I did that for about five years coding and, you know, writing codes for, uh, you know, mobile uh, audio and video uh, and image systems. I actually, frankly, you know, got bored of, you know, routine, you know, I think, you know, my, my behavior has always been, you know, I, to look for something new. I think the curiosity is always innate, you know, that I think that's one of the qualities also required for venture capital. And that was there, you know, I, I, I couldn't be tied myself, you know, uh, to doing a routine, uh, you know, same, uh, you know, kind of a repetitive task uh, again and again. And that, you know, made me to quit uh, the first uh, job at engineering and then join another startup um, called Just Books. Uh, you might be familiar, you know, Just Books has around, uh, you know, 60 plus outlets across you know, 13, 14 cities. Mm -hmm. So I joined, the startup was getting incubated at uh, IMB at NSRCL. Um, I joined that and, you know, I was there for about five years. Uh, that's where I learned bulk of my, you know, business and marketing skills. And I was head of marketing there. Uh, when I moved out of the company and that was my second job and during this second job right I was exposed to a lot of startup you know what's happening in the startup world because we were a startup right in the first place and and that led to you know me to do angel investments uh, you know uh, at that time and uh, I mean I had something in mind I don't know you know it could be some crazy idea that you know before 30 you know I should invest in one company at least <laughs> and I did invest you know before before I turned 30 in one, one uh, company because I thought that's my long-term career goal, uh, right? I did, you know, uh, force myself to, you know, uh, do some things, you know, to make that investment. And I did do that. And I was fortunate, you know, to have a few people who could help me figure out, you know, what was happening at that time in 2014, I think this was. And I did invest uh, uh, in a few companies and um, then I quit uh, just books. And uh, I tried my hand at my own startup for some time uh, that failed, uh, I would say. Uh, uh, from there, you know, I started consulting a few startups uh, uh, and eventually, you know, joined Kalari full time in 2016. Uh, yeah, literally, you know, that's the point of uh, where I really wanted to be. And uh, I think Kalari gave me the opportunity to you know, learn and, you know, uh, express myself. Uh, you know, in the venture ecosystem, and uh, that that's it. Uh, I learned there. You know, I was doing seed investments uh, there largely, and that eventually led to Java Capital. Yeah, that's a brief one. You know, I just want to make it <laughs> easy for people to digest. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, can you talk a little bit about uh, Just Books and, and what was the idea behind behind Just Books? 
So I think, you know, the founder of Just Books, right? Again, it's an interesting story, right? So I used to work in Whitefield and was the first outlet of Just Books, right? The mm-hmm. founder himself was experimenting, uh, Mr. Sundar. Uh, he had set up an outlet in Whitefield. So I used to pass by that outlet every day, okay? Mm-hmm. And and I, I took a few books and, you know, realized what's happening and all that. And one coincidental, you know, event in uh, IIM Bangalore, uh, and I met uh, uh, the prof- professor Suresh there. Uh, he was doing uh, a session on, you know, entrepreneurship and startups. And he mentioned that, you know, Just Books is, you know, incubated in IM Bangalore. And and I had seen that physically, but I didn't know it was a startup, right? So so that coincidence, right, really played well. And I then wrote to the founder uh, saying, you know, look, I'm very interested to work and uh, join. And, you know, what is Just Books, right, is actually, it's like, you know, it's a library chain, but it's a new age library chain, you know, a new age retail library chain, mm-hmm. incorporating, you know, some of the latest technologies like RFID for inventory, uh, very well mapped uh, inventory mechanism, you know, a lot of, you know, I would say, uh, fancy jazz uh, at some level, you know, to make, you know, life easier for, you don't need like too many people to maintain a library, you know, of 10,000 books, we used to have like one executive to manage. So it was like a new age technology enabled uh, library chain. And I was passionate about reading any which way, right? I used to read a lot. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so it, 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 it was just, you know, uh, both passionate and also wanting to, you know, try and do something beyond what I was already doing led me to just books and uh, i think you know just books was a mix of technology uh, retail and books uh, that's how i would put it as and it expanded you know uh, very fast you know in those years uh, but yeah but it could scale up in a big way uh, beyond you know that uh, and that was the nature of the beast yeah yeah uh, could you speak about your next startup that you started after just books Yeah, so so I, I think see after just books, right? I was looking to see, you know, uh, what what else uh, should I do, and I was passionate about a couple of things. One is books, travel, and you know, food. Uh, so I thought, you know, let me tap into the food industry, and you know, during that time, you know, uh, coincidentally, the food tech boom was happening, and I started something called Simply Cook, uh, which was basically, you know, trying to bring in you know, authentic recipes in a ready to cook manner. Uh, uh, if you wish, right, the easiest way to relate to that is, right, uh, is like uh, making a soup or, you know, blue apron in the US to some extent. So mm-hmm. that's what I did, you know, where everything used to be ready. You just need to stand in front of a cooking station and you know, drop the items into the bowl and, you know, get it cooked in a way, right? So that was a, a Let's say it's a between uh, getting from a Swiggy and, you know, getting it from Big Basket or somewhere in between, you know, processed, uh, mm-hmm. all that. So I did that. I think the market was not ready or, you know, I don't, I think even now, you know, I think, you know, the market's not ready uh, for that kind of an experiment. And I did try that for about eight to nine months. Uh, really didn't uh, uh, take off. And, you know, I, then I d- decided to shut it down and, you know, uh, move on. Yeah. And that was a food uh, startup that I ended up doing, yeah. Right. So, so can you talk about the uh, Kalari? Uh, so what was what was your role there? What were you doing? How, how you got hired? Um, a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, uh, right, like after I shut down this startup, Simply Cook, right, um, I was looking what to do as a career, right? You know, I knew that, you know, venture capital, as I said earlier, right, I had got exposed to it a little earlier. And I knew it, it is something. So I started writing to almost every uh, VC in the country, literally, you know, saying, you know, can I, uh, can I be a part of the team? You know, can I help you guys? You know, and I had also invested and made these angel investments, right? I thought, you know, that will also add on to the profile. You know, I did tell people, you know, I'm very interested. Uh, but as luck may have, right, uh, very few actually responded. And, you know, most uh, VCs, you know, didn't respond, uh, you know, to my emails, cold emails, these were cold emails. So all you know, right? A few did respond to so saying, you know, uh, you may not fit the bill. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and I was consulting a few startups at that time, like, you know, Beehive and others, uh, doing a side gig, uh, if you wish, uh, Kalari, you know, opened an application process, you know, for its fellowship in 2016. And I thought, you know, that was a great opportunity, right? So I did apply for that and 
um fortunately i did make it through uh, and uh, that's how you know i got into kalari gap uh, and and i spent my first two years you know learning the ropes uh, as a part of the fellowship at kalari and you know the next two years i spent you know uh, doing seed stage investments see at kalari my role was you know uh, a lot of initial year i would have spent learning the ropes you know trying to figure out what's happening you know and supporting uh, partners and uh, you know other uh, Uh, people in the company as i progressed right i started developing my, my own thinking on how to make decisions how to evaluate companies uh, you know and, and that slowly evolved and then you know i i was almost you know the longest uh, uh, serving uh, employee of uh, fiestart uh, after a point in time because i had spent the bulk of uh, you know the three and a half years you know doing seed stage investments there and which involved you know organizing you know investment committees sourcing companies you know managing companies helping them fundraise uh, for the next round uh, doing portfolio management uh, you know all this put together you know these were I, i actually divide it typically into any vc job into three things right which involves sourcing and investing uh, then managing and you know uh, helping the company and also do exit management these are three things So I was doing all these, uh, uh, you know, except for exit management because the companies are pretty early, and that's what I was doing at uh, uh, Kalari for about uh, three, four years then. Yeah. Um, so th- th- uh, by the time you had already joined Kalari, uh, had you already done angel investment at Daily Ninja and the other companies? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All my angel investments were prior to joining Kalari. I didn't make any investments after I joined Kalari mm-hmm. because it doesn't look uh, there's a conflict of interest, you know, to make investments once you're part of a venture capital firm. So mm-hmm. I stopped making investments after that. Uh, all the investments, those personal investments, were prior to that. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, now I've started making investments, you know, through Java Capital, obviously. Yeah, where I am also putting in my money and. and that's where we are at today at java capital uh, you know we just started a year ago yeah maybe you know i can talk a little bit about uh, java capital since we are here sure. look as i i really wanted to you know create a lot more impact uh, than uh, uh, what i was uh, uh, you know uh, possibly able to do at uh, kalari right uh, so i did i decided to uh, move on and set up java capital along with uh, kartik and bargavi uh kartik is my ex colleague at uh, kalari and bargavi is a old friend you know from my startup consulting days and uh, we've been talking about you know setting up of a venture capital firm for a long time you know let's say 4 5 years and it there's only a matter of time for me it was not like uh, will i do it or not it is a question of when and uh, last year you know just before the pandemic right uh, uh, we decided to do this right and um, we didn't know what's going to come right the pandemic we didn't know we decided in december that you know we got to do this uh, 2019 december and you know you have the pandemic on our doorsteps you know by february uh, you know early february we are late late uh, february we had the pandemic right so there was this conscious call you know irrespective of the pandemic right i put in my papers to go ahead and we decided to go ahead and do java capital last year uh, you know a uh, similar time and it's been almost a year now uh since we started java capital and java capital's focus is very very clear right we do pre seed investments uh typically about 150000 dollars to 250000 dollars check sizes um try and enter companies at the very earliest stage you know a sweet spot is anywhere between uh in terms of valuation you know between 2 to 4 million dollars uh and 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 there are a few spaces also right we are very keen on even though we are almost a sector agnostic uh, kind of a setup java is uh, we kind of also focus on a few sectors uh, like uh, you know healthcare uh, financial technologies uh, saas uh, deep tech and consumer and consumer brands right consumer tech and consumer brands these are about five areas where we are much more focused even though we invest in you know uh, other areas you know we are happy to look at it very opportunistically so that's been the journey so we as of now you know since last year we invested in you know more than 10 companies uh, we would have deployed anywhere between a million dollars to million and a half uh, dollars over the last one year uh, and that's been a good journey so far you know in the last one year at java capital yeah. so uh, i wanted to know if uh, vc is bringing the capital and uh, what else do they bring into the companies apart from the capital 
so look uh, you know i think any 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 anything to grow and thrive right requires more than money money is required yes but money today right is actually available right you know in, mm. in a country like ours money is quite available you know i would say everywhere you know it, it, obviously for the right companies right so it is it is that way right money is available but where do you where do entrepreneurs want to take money from right it's that's a bigger question right like entrepreneurs have a choice today because capital is available it's no more you know that the investors can dictate the terms also right to a large extent right capital is available what 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 what's needed is for like for how do how why should an investor for example you know uh, work with us right you know why does should an investor choose us like how we choose entrepreneurs also right it's like a mutual uh relationship in some level that it's not like somebody has an upper hand over somebody else right it's literally that way both entrepreneurs and investors you know choose and you know decide to work together where do we, where do we come you know beyond money you know over the years what we built is a strong network of people uh, be it entrepreneurs other investors uh and you know uh our career friends right so so those are networks that you know are very valuable for us to you know help uh our founders uh be it you know in recruiting people or you know helping them raise an extra round of money um or you know trying to solve some problems for them or organizing some sessions for example right we organized in the last one year about five to six sessions for our portfolio founders right uh, internally we call these are as java bean house session you know we have an internal group for, for our entrepreneurs and we conduct you know almost monthly a uh, session you know last you know a couple of days ago we we had a session on you know employee stock options you know how do you go about you know doing your esop options uh, mm-hmm. a month before that we had uh, one of the executives from you know one of the top ai firms in india uh, talk about you know how do how to use and you know data and ai you know in an early stage company so we bring that you know pool of experts you know who can help our founders and also you know find investors for the future and also try and help them in recruitment see you know i i would say you know this is the strongest value add that java provides today uh, in terms of you know uh, uh, beyond the uh, capital that we kind of bring in yeah sure so so going back to your uh, angel investments that that you you did with uh, daily ninja so i mean that's that's just one example so uh with your angel investments that you that you did uh, so can you walk us through the the process uh, how do you decide which company to to invest in uh, this you i believe you you did it as an individual and not as part of an organization so correct so can you correct. can you talk talk a little bit about that yeah yeah i think you know when i did angel in, uh, daily ninja right the times were very different you know from what it is today right today right the number of angel investors you know number of entrepreneurs are all in large numbers you know there's a, a lot of capital available at those in those times right i think this is like i'm talking of when i say those times you know less than you know 5 6 years ago it was harder to find capital you know for very early stage startups and um, you know daily ninja actually i came across on one of the platforms uh, syndicate platforms then i spoke to the entrepreneur and um, i could actually you know closely relate to what they were doing you know uh, 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 of delivering you know milk every day and it was creating a very sticky uh, consumer experience and then you could sell on top of that actually that was one of the key factors you know that convinced me to say look i want to invest in daily ninja mm-hmm. and really the reason for that was right look everybody's insights are very different right like i had myself right my uncle actually used to run, run a Uh, milk line uh, you know when i was a kid right i have gone with him you know early in the mornings and you know seen how does a milk line work on the roads so i had like personally seen the experience of how does a milk line work and i could kind of you know immediately relate to what daily ninja was doing because they were like delivering milk every day and top of it you know they were delivering other things you know which can increase margin so i could immediately relate to my past experience with what they were doing and an intervention of technology you know uh, not just you know doing it uh, like in the old fashioned way that you know or my uncle was doing so that immediately helped me make a connect with daily ninja and i did invest and it turned out to be pretty good so far uh, the company got acquired by uh, big basket sometime mm-hmm. yeah and uh, i continue to be uh, still holding it i have not sold out yet so i'm happy you know whenever big basket go grows big you know i'd be happy to <laughs> sell at the later point in time yeah right So, so how uh, do you decide uh, right uh, you know uh, see you asked right how do you decide uh, on um, 
Mm -hmm. the larger question that you brought out right like daily ninja is just one example right yeah uh, larger question on how currently i decide to invest in companies right is uh, very very uh, clear in my head at least look there are multiple approaches which people can take my approach has always been a market first approach firstly you know i want to see that you know there's a large uh, problem statement and there's a market you know that's kind of there once that's there right i think you know i go first on the market and you know i get excited about the market because there are people who get excited about the founders you know and then they'll figure out i am more like a market guy and then i see you know can the founder execute after that if these two things match right look more than you know 70 80% i am convinced that you know we should invest if these two are convincing enough for me post that obviously you do a lot more other checks and diligences you know you know unit economics and all these you know you just check you know which you learned over the years and you know then you decide but i also learned right look in investing right the faster you decide right those investments have actually done very well for me the more i have prolonged you know making a decision on investment they have not turned out well for me uh which to me in my mind right is also an indication saying you know a lot of investing decision is not just about you know analyzing it and over analyzing it it's a lot about you know your own past experience that you can bring to the day table uh and you know some amount of muscle memory that's got built over the years today right today i call it muscle memory you know some people may call it gut uh, you know uh look uh, it is a muscle memory and you know you get a sense of you know a company you know really in the first 10 minutes almost literally you know that's how i see it as mm-hmm. and then after that you know it continues to go positively and then you make an investment that's the current scenario i'm not saying you should not do all the other data checking you know other things you have to do diligence but that's typically you know how i end up making decisions i'm usually able to decide in the first half an hour you know if i'm likely to invest in a company or not Uh, which is strange but that's how it happens for me and i have actually seen it you know it has actually worked in a lot of cases for us uh, so i am happy to stick to my framework which is worked for me and each each one right has to evolve their own framework for decision making even though there are uh, available frameworks but it it's like a, a nuanced uh, you know sometimes a very personal uh, decision also at some level and your past experience like look my uncle's milk line helped me to make a decision on daily ninja for example another company called trail right mm-hmm. i had worked on a similar product called first smile when i was at just books right that helped me to pick that company so right. so a lot of it is like personal experience is driving me to make this investment right uh, so so that that matters you know where you come from your past experiences uh, you know in deciding to back an entrepreneur or a particular market because you already have a sense of certain things in that particular market and the flip side is you know if you are not exposed to a market right the decision making gets harder you will have to spend a lot more time learning about the market first you know before you can make a decision then you know which which does happen sometimes you know like for example i was looking at a uh, uh, rpa company which is a, a robotic platform you know automation you know that's kind of started right a lot of uh, robotic process automation company i have not spent a lot of time on it but i did come across you know it looked very interesting but what does it mean is i have to go sit and learn now yeah for me to learn right uh, you need curiosity in the first place and if you want to be a vc right you are an investor for that matter you need to be curious in life firstly <laughs> if you are curious right you will learn new things and you will be you will be willing to learn about new things you will be willing to talk to new people you will be willing to listen to new ideas if you are not curious right look this our job is very hard innately right this this is driven by curiosity you need to want to know you know what's happening to the world what 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 go, what what can go right you know what can change the world right that curiosity has to be there in you if you really want to become an investor uh, or an vc for that matter right so so that that continues to say and that is one of the key things i feel you know that drives me to keep on looking for what's happening next uh, what's the next big thing in this world uh, be it like you know for example i track very closely what's happening on the vaccine front you know because just curiosity for me right which which is the next big vaccine that will come out of for india or something example right i'm giving so curiosity is key to vc uh, and to investing you know frankly and to learning also frankly yeah coming to your uh, market first approach so how important do uh, 
consumer behavior play in entrepreneur uh, uh if i kind of understand your question right right uh, look market is a function of consumer behavior right in the first place uh ability to observe and listen and learn i said earlier right is exactly consumer behavior right can i look at a certain behavior of consumers which i can relate to a particular market that that is what really market is right uh and and that comes from observing understanding reading and learning right and and that's the consumer behavior understanding when i said market right it includes that right you know uh, trying to gauge will a product like that you know help somebody you know will it solve a pain for somebody and it comes from that right i mean I, i wouldn't go and you know fund a company you know which is not you know enticing to anybody or to a consumer right or if a consumer is not going to buy why will i fund that company right that's why i said you know market first approach means you know understanding is there a market and how big is the market also in the first place right and and consumer behavior or human behavior plays a critical part in understanding you know market uh, directions and you know how does a product fit into a market so well, that's critical uh, you know for making investments absolutely critical if you do a market first approach see if you do a founder first approach right what does that mean right look if you do a founder first op- op- approach also right he has to go and find a product right to sell in a market so market eventually becomes like uh what do you call the mother if the market is bad right even even if you put the genius into the market right he'll fail so at the end of the day right to me right if you draw a grid of you know uh, founder types versus market types right the market will always win put a great founder in a bad market the market will still win you put a good market and a bad founder right still the market will win you put a bad founder in a good market market will still win so in some sense right i my my framework is that look market will win so keep an eye on that uh, if a founder is good right he will pivot to the right market that's the approach a lot of other people take right you find a founder who's great uh, if he messes up on the first market right or the product he'll you know pivot and you know find another market which eventually boils down to saying boss look if the market is right uh, you know the founder will figure out right so might as well say look this is a market first approach so that's my belief like look the investors over the decades right have had different different approaches for example sequoia right historically has been a market first investor at least in the us in 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 for the other the other side is right arthur uh, right arthur if you have like looked at it he is a founder first right he says look i'll pick the founder and i'll allow him to figure out you know what to do so it's different styles you know i'm not saying you know this is be- better over another but each one picks you know what really works for them over the years right so uh, talking about uh, angel investing right uh, so uh, what is the the education needed for anyone to become an angel investor is that something that can be learned over a, over a period of time because no one has taught this in in universities and and grad schools so yeah so how do you yeah. how do you learn to become an angel investor can anyone do that yeah no absolutely you can do that right i did it right i learned by spending time and money you know you have to will be willing to spend money also not just time okay <laughs> if you want to learn uh, you know if you just assume you know i'll read and you know get get going with a course and all that you know that's not happening for example right one year ago right the first thing that i started is an angel course right at java capital yeah we have an angel course right i have ran like seven cohorts so far we ran like seven cohorts we like informed and educated you know about close to you know 75 to 100 investors created angel investors in some form or other because we felt you no know, there's an absolute market gap today right our model is almost being launched globally literally you know every other person i, I mean in us i've seen a few people launching what we've done like one year ago right mm-hmm. uh, and and that shows right look there's an absolute need you know and we wanted to do that and we did do that you know and we continue to do that you know uh, we've kind of pulled on hold due to the pandemic otherwise i think that's a story that we will continue to do where we will build a pool of angels you know which is uh, we will do and it is it is doable right it's not like um you know any you know frankly speaking anybody can do it just that you know they need to understand you know the risk appetite and the nuances of doing it which is what we help them teach and you know and they should also be willing to spare money they should have spare capital which they should be willing to lose if mm-hmm. the curiosity to learn and some spare capital available is good to start angel investing right okay 
and there are channels available we are teaching like us you know there are other networks a lot of channels available lot of content available you can start learning make the first few investments you know uh, with help of someone and uh, then you know after you figure out yourself you know that you are good at this or you figured this uh, out you know then you start doing it independently also you know, i also learned it lad only right i mean i didn't come and you know say i like you know with an angel investing course or a background already right i invested in so many of these companies that we spoke about right see all the companies that we spoke of are all, all something which we did which i did well or it did well for me but i have companies which shut down right which is also on my profile like companies like cardback crazy all of these companies are shut down that means i lost all my money there mm-hmm. so so but willingness willing willingness to lose money that means you know you have enough capital and you can and spare some capital to lose that is the first risk taking you know appetite you know if you have that you know then it becomes slightly easier to learn got it. so um so is it like building a portfolio where one company makes huge amount disproportionate returns and all of them others all of the others may or may not end up uh, giving you returns so is that is that how it works uh, i mean typically historically speaking yeah 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 historically speaking that's how it's worked and i, I don't think so that's going to change anytime soon uh, you know look uh, this is uh, information asymmetry problem right uh when i say information asymmetry right when i'm investing in a company and making a decision right i don't have all the information right because i don't know if some other investor is investing in a competitor i don't know what the market forces are going to change like if a pandemic like this hits right i don't know what market forces change right so exactly for that reason right because everything is not under your control and that's the reason for information asymmetry when you're making a decision on a lot of information asymmetry right then you also you know ensure that probability comes into play which is purely mathematical probability right so mm-hmm. how do you beat mathematical probability is you know by taking a lot more bets and you know allowing the math- mathematical probability to play and it so happens in angel and venture investing right the mathematical probability follows something called the power law uh, you know in most of the other cases where it follows something called the normal distribution so this the yeah. venture outcome follows power law distribution what does that mean is if you invest in like uh, uh, your probability of returning a large outcome is actually pretty low okay chances are very low that is the meaning of the power law okay mm-hmm. and that means if you invest in 10 or 15 companies one or two companies will become a massive hit that will return all the money that you invested in these 10 15 companies plus give you something more on top of it okay so that is the mechanism right so if i like like you i mentioned right these five companies that you would have seen on my linkedin profile yeah three companies died two companies are doing well i am i am i am i am very fortunate in that way right in five i've got two which my mathematical probability is in pretty good maybe my picking capability is also good see this mathematical probability does not mean that you know uh, you randomly throw money at companies and it will work it may work but that means you have to throw money at like a lot a huge number of companies you may have to throw money mm-hmm. at 100 companies one or two or you know maybe 10 will work for you you know that will still work because that's how math works right i can't stop math from working right you can do but what's the what what is that i as an investor can do is our ability to pick a better company matters then you know my probability will be 1 in 10 rather than you know say 4 in 100 or something like that you know which you just throw money at it and you know figure out you know if one thing lands you know it works or not you know so it works for some people frankly speaking right it's like you know you you, you invest in enough companies maybe one becomes a massive one imagine you had picked an uber if the returns will be so huge you know whatever money you invested in the 100 companies right doesn't even matter it look very minuscule it does happen uh, but you need to be clear in your head what are you trying to do look are you just throwing money and you know caution to wind and investing in some 100 companies uh, or you know you want to go and, and talk to people you know learn from them a little bit and you know reduce the chance and you know reduce probability of getting a better winner and that's what we do we want to try and get a winner let's say in 1 in 10 or you know 1 in 15 you know that's our job to try and you know, use our experience and guide you know people to invest with us uh, so that you know th- we can produce you know those kind of uh, returns yeah so so one thing which i was uh, curious to understand was that when uh, when we go to your website and fill out the form uh, hmm. for enrolling to the angel investor course 
one of the questions mentioned uh, it greater than or lesser than the net worth is greater than mm. or less than 2 crores so mm. how does that matter here how is that relevant uh, just curious yeah, yeah yeah interesting right look there are uh, there's a reason for that i'll tell you uh, firstly right you want to get people you know who have enough uh, capital to deploy as i said earlier see look if a guy who guy or a uh, or a, a woman uh, who has uh, uh, two crores net worth right then they can spare you know let's say 10 15 20% of the capital which is like 20 30 lakhs to start investing right. that means you know they have the risk capital they also have the capital in some sense you don't want somebody who is having only 15 lakhs you know and wanting to invest 15 lakhs right that's like obviously he can take a call but mm-hmm. you know that's like risky right it's an extreme risk to take that's one reason you know just to make sure that you have very informed and you know people who have risk appetite for this and have capital to invest i'll tell you the second reason this is much more a regulatory reason that we put that see even though right we we take people you know whose net worth is lower than uh, 2 crores also to be a part of our angel course if people who want to learn one of the reasons to put that is there are guidelines under uh, the securities and exchange board of india sebi uh, we have we use an alternate investment fund which requires you know a net worth de- net worth declaration of 2 crores to invest in startups okay. that's one of the reasons for us to gauge you know the kind of people that we get you know we put that condition that's the kind of criteria in india us has a different criteria different countries may have different kind of criteria at least some countries may not have any criteria on it. Hmm. but india's criteria under the alternate investment funds under sebi guidelines this is a criteria you need to have a 2 crore net worth apart from your primary residence that makes you eligible for investing in aifs as an angel investor that's the reason for that right so uh, coming back to market first uh can you hmm. intuitively uh, know what is the product market fit for a company so how do you know as an investor and as an entrepreneur you know the correct uh, product market fit very hard to know that's what i said right <laughs> information asymmetry right um you you won't know literally when you start the product right you you are you doing all the research that saying you know there's a need in the product you're doing all the analysis dicing slicing all data research reports you look at all this to study the market first right once you have confidence that's when you go and launch a startup startup you don't launch a startup and then look for a market right what to sell <laughs> you look for a market find a problem first do all the research you know you take 6 months do the research full research then launch it or even start the company right don't go and say okay i want to do a startup now i'll start up then i'll figure out what the problem is research first do all the work uh then you know it's easier to find a product market fit but having said that right i would still say my product market fit is very very iterative process you launch it you see how our customers reacting then you do, you know then tweak the product again then launch again you know tweak some features until you are at a point right where you start seeing customer pull you know that means when i say customer pull you should start seeing demand being generated and people talking about the product or you know adoption happening you know after the initial push so initially you have to push you'll have no choice but after a particular point right it reaches a critical number right you will start seeing maybe inbound emails or somebody is asking you right that is the point of product of product market fit it's not it's not like a very objective process it it, it is a very uh nuanced uh subjective process you need to keep looking at various data points to say you know look okay i'm closer to this and one of the ways is to see you know is demand happening is inbound happening and and uh, if you have genuinely solved a problem right and people will you know start looking for a product what you've built and then you know yeah there's a product market fit but it's it's not easy as as, as i put it also right it's much more harder problem and that is a holy grail of you know uh the zero to one uh, uh thing right uh, from the initial to finding out you know is the problem and the correct solution before you start scaling right and that is a product market fit uh, uh, problem and and as investors right it's hard for us also right because we are investing at the stage which is in the zero to one phase so our our shot right is also somewhat you know uh, probabilistic right so we are taking a bet on the market and the founder that they will figure out a product market fit especially at our stage of investing pre seed stage and seed stage of investing a slightly series a series b right then market fit is almost there 
and you know you know where it's to grow and how to grow and for us right that's why it's even riskier when you are angel investing and investing you know at our stage right the risk is even higher so the chances of you know companies failing are even higher at our stage you know compared to series a and series b so uh, and and that's the only answer right there is no magic answer to product market fit you will, you can read a lot of framework you know how to approach and you know all those are methodologies that exist but it doesn't happen without a lot of uh, you know intuition and iterative uh, process to figure out you know your product market fit right so um, if you talk about the difference between uh, vcs and and angel investing so um, what is the the typical amount of value that is that is uh, that an investor invest uh, as an angel investor and and vc so what is that difference uh, of how much an investment so is look uh, yeah yeah so look an angel investor can invest as low as today yeah. uh, uh, 1 lakh to you know as high as whatever he wants right literally mm-hmm. but typically most angel investors you know i mean end up investing in anywhere between you know 5 lakh to 25 lakhs kind of ranges individually mm-hmm. Hmm. So, VCs, uh, uh, right? Obviously, invest a lot more capital, uh, hmm. uh, right? Because that's the full-time job, and they have capital from large institutions or you know from their LPs. Uh, uh, invest uh, a larger uh, uh, chunk. That's the big difference in terms of capital alone. Obviously, in terms of value and right, those those are you know uh, other things that come into play between a difference between an angel and a See the other thing to keep in mind, right? Look, angel investors come in really early. They are called angel investors, you know, for a reason, right? You come in, you know, when the rest of the world doesn't believe in your product, the rest of the world doesn't believe in the founder, the rest of the world doesn't believe in the market. An angel investor is called an angel investor for that reason, right? So, angel investors come in at a very early stage, support the founder, you know, help the founder out, and that's how. it is uh, been happening over the years obviously you know in the recent past you have syndicates angel syndicates uh, a lot of work is done by you know people like us and then angel investors you know can just invest you know with us and you know it makes life slightly easier you don't need to do the heavy lifting right we do all the heavy lifting of shortlisting sourcing and, and you know interacting with the entrepreneur or you know investing and they invest in us and you know then we in turn invest into the, the companies So that's starting to happen, you know. So that's creating different types of angel investors. That's why you know passive angel investors and active angel investors, for example, right? Active are the ones who are directly talking to companies, sourcing them, you know, helping these founders. Passive ones are just investing their capital, you know, as a dis, uh, risk uh, diversification uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, and 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 the big difference, right? VCs always come in a little late than you know angel investors come in. So appetite for risk is much higher. Uh, for uh, uh, angel investors compared to you know venture capital investors right. so but, as a vc yeah yeah but in today's world right what you are seeing right today right the the lines are almost very blurry right you know we have you know venture capital investors investing very early you know everybody wants to invest early today right the current market at least i'm telling you so there are no clear uh, what do you call lines drawn or separations between angel seed pre seed vc all that everybody is investing everywhere at every stage almost now so it's very hard to you know differentiate at least in india now you know it's become very hard you know everybody is investing in every stage yeah so uh, as a vc firm uh, so do you have any uh, goals set out that you know we have to get a return maybe 5 10 times within a certain amount of within maybe 5 10 years so yeah. is for that yeah so look right vcs typically have a number in their head because it's a fund close ended right in a way we we do have some numbers in mind uh, like anywhere between you know uh, across portfolio right you, i don't measure it across a company right across my portfolio i would say mm-hmm. if i am able to return anywhere between you know Three and a half to five x said I'll be very happy in like five years. Okay. The rough number I'm saying, you know, three and a half to five x. I'll be very happy across portfolio that mm-hmm. I've invested in, let's say, in fifteen months, right? Every fifteenth month, you know, if I can return, you know, one and a to three and a half x to five uh, x, uh, right? I'll be very happy as an investor, and I would obviously, you know, and able to deliver to my investors with that kind of return. 
VCs also have similar ranges, man. Anywhere between, you know, about minimum is at least look 3x uh, in a fund ka lifestyle, at least. 3x is the minimum that you are expected to return in any VC fund because given inflation and, you know, mm-hmm. your uh, opportunity cost for money, minimum 3x is expected. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to talk about one of your investments at uh, Java, the, the e-plane company. So, hmm. so, what did you see in that organization? So, how did you meet the founders and, and uh, th- doesn't the idea sound a little crazy if you, if you think about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, look, uh, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, when you look, you know, it would sound crazy, you know, I'm not... Uh, uh, ours to that uh, it's you know it's a crazy investment we also think you know it's a very very outlier investment right uh, uh, and we are willing to do such investments uh, that's the signal that we are telling to the market that you know we're looking and you know investing in such companies right. so how, how we got this company you know uh, like i said i've maintained a strong network grateful to one of uh, the venture venture capital firms specially invest they're good friends uh, they referred this deal to us uh and you know we just said you know yeah absolutely we spoke to the founders uh and uh founder is uh, a combination of uh, a professor from uh, iit madras and uh, another student uh who studied at iit yeah? it's a combination of very young blood and you know old experience if you wish and we felt the team had the capability you know to take this if not this team which team i didn't know because you know the professor is an aerospace professor and also comes with a very strong credentials you know having run uh, advise other companies like agni cool uh, and i and i known the professor uh, and other companies for almost two three years in a way so that was like really giving us the confidence to say yeah look this is an interesting uh, company and we should take a bet on that and uh, and that's how you know we take a shot we took a shot at uh, e-planes and it is doing well you know after we've invested you know naval ravikant invested uh, you know, it is doing pretty well as of now, you know, meeting its milestones. Uh, we are very excited. I, I'll tell you the other reason also our inspiration to do something like this, right? Look, Bangalore, right? I'm in Bangalore, right? Yeah. I have like faced the traffic problem like for years now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when, when you look at a solution like this, right? You just get inspired saying, look, you are facing a problem, right? Why don't you support somebody who's solving this, right? So that exactly is how you think at some time. And the problem statement was very clear. Vertical takeoff landing vehicle. It can fly from electronic city to, let's say, MG road. Uh, and that's what you really need, uh, frankly, in a city like Bangalore. Unless you're saying because of the pandemic, right, all cities uh, will not survive as big or something, right? We don't know, right? So those are possible changes in the market forces, like I mentioned. But we are very excited, you know, for the team and, you know, what they're building. Absolutely excited to see that, yeah. Sure. So, so when is the next yeah go ahead yeah. okay so uh, coming to this part uh, so hmm. how important is the government regulation in terms of investment and uh... yeah see look government has been very very uh, helpful uh, in most cases right they have been proactive you have sebi's guidelines on uh, ai investments uh, uh, the government of India has been launching, you know, supporting startups, you know, extensively over the last, uh, 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 you know, uh, five years, if you've noticed, right, so many programs have been launched. See, reg- regulations uh, uh, have been actually positive, good tailwinds, frankly speaking. Imagine, you know, private companies are allowed to launch rockets in the country today. Very few countries allow that. Uh, so we have like, you know, in, uh, in space in India, which helps uh, with that. Then um, uh, actually, you know, government has been opening up, you know, in a big way in a lot of regulated sectors. Like I spoke about rocket, right? Uh, uh, that's one option. And even the e-plane company that we talk about, right? Uh, uh, as recently, right? Uh, e- the e-plane company doesn't require any new regulations, technically speaking, because it's a human piloted electric taxi. That's all, right? It, 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 it flies. If it can prove airworthiness and in the existing guidelines of a flying aeroplane it fits into that this is not a drone or right or something right this is a human piloted vehicle so there's no new regulations you know uh, that needs to apply for e-planes frankly speaking uh but having said that you have dgca opening up vtol uh, visual line of non beyond visual line of sight vehicles for the pandemic right for delivering medicines and other things experimental test flights are being allowed 
So actually, look, we have a great tailwind story on the regulations uh, as we speak, uh, and it was there even prior to the pandemic. Uh, and that augurs really well for uh, a country like ours. And uh, I'm very happy that, you know, whatever the government is doing, can it do more? Absolutely, it can do more. Man. We are all greedy, right? We want to do more and want the, everybody to do more, right? For example, right, one of the things that I am always not happy about, right? As an angel investor, right, you invest. When you make capital gains, right, you are taxed at a very high rate. So imagine, right, I am investing and I am taxed at a higher slab than even listed equities. Hmm. So, so the government should look and say, look, you know, maybe I should bring it on par. Investors are taking the risk to invest. Make it easier for investors. At least make the tax uh, gains lower, or you know, at least on par with you know listed equity. So, like that's like something we've been lobbying right uh, for uh, some time. I will get heard out. So, but overall trend has been that you know very positive regulatory environment in the country. So I, I see, you know, the government keeps listening and, you know, keeps making changes. Absolutely. So, so uh, what is the difference between uh, investment in other countries and investment in India? In That's terms of what? Like? In terms of the amount, the speed of investment uh, and the companies that they invest in. See, look, uh, I don't have an answer to all other countries, right? <laughs> I, at least the US at, at is the only US. other country that I've followed. Yeah, at least the US is the only country that I've followed closely or, you know, uh, I have also made some investments there, right? See, the US regulations have similar uh, accreditation process, uh, which also, you know, but, but their regulations also make it very, very fast, uh, you know, to make an investment, uh, you know, a paperwork is actually very reduced. Today, for me to do a transaction, right, I still will require a minimum of one and a half months to complete a transaction. In the US, right, a transaction can be done if everything is ready in like less than a couple of days, right? So there are still a lot of those things. And, and also, right, capital availability in the US is way more higher and market size is much bigger given the depth of the market. And, and that's not like complaining, right? What I'm saying is US has a history of venture capital for like 50 years and we are like what 20 not even 20 you know like as i said right 2006 is like the benchmark year you know for we see in india literally to start so we're this 15 year old ecosystem and angel investors right also right so i think market will develop its depth so 10 years ago when i was investing also right let's say not exactly 10 7 8 years ago like number of angel investors are only 1000 in this country today there are 10 to 15000 angel investors man that's like huge development right so we are adding you know we are adding people we are adding resources we are adding capital uh, yeah regulations can keep up make life easier for investors and founders a lot more definitely ease of business can be eased uh, and the other thing to keep in mind right when investing in india right as an angel investor or even as a venture capital investor the timeline for an exit is much longer compared to us us right companies grow faster they're able to turn around and return capital faster uh, so that means you know the capital gets recycled much faster which creates a lot more capital pool creates a lot more winners creates a lot more angel investors and the likes in india right it takes a little more time because we are early in the ecosystem, right? Look, our IPO thing is, Zomato is being talked about, right? Now that is going to be one of the biggest IPOs okay. as and when it happens, right? In the startup ecosystem. How many companies have gone IPO? Not too many, right? So yeah. so, so it takes time. I, I would say, you know, you will have to be a little more patient in India if you're an investor compared to, you know, uh, US. Uh, that's the big difference, I would say, yeah. So, so uh, I believe you might be listening to a lot of uh, pitches from a lot of founders on a regular basis. So, so what is the one thing that as soon as you uh, hear someone say it turns you off, uh, as soon as someone says something, is there a, is there a buzzword that everyone keeps saying uh, and, and it turns you off? Maybe uh, you don't believe in what, what the founder is saying. Mm, interesting, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think, you know, what's the buzzword? Um, I, 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 I don't know the recent buzzwords, but uh, look, I think, you know, if you use technology mm -hmm. uh, or any cutting edge technology, right, solve the problem and use the right, right amount of technology. Don't use technology for the sake of technology, right? For example, <laughs> let's say I can solve a problem. I can solve a problem using rudimentary, uh, you know, coding and some simple algorithms. 
I do want for that problem to be solved using AI and machine learning. Frankly speaking, mm -hmm. so 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 te uh, technology uh, used for the right uh, reasons, right, is really matters. It is all toolbox, right? So a lot of uh, founders, right, not now. I think you know, year back, right, you would see oh, AI, ML, blockchain, <laughs> that this and all in decks and all. I mean, boss, okay, fine, but tell me, is it really required for you? If it's not required, okay, these are all toolboxes. You, if you need the tool, use it. Absolutely use it, right? If it's required, but if it's not needed, you know, just for the sake of putting it somewhere, you know, don't do it. We'll figure out, you know, we we, we are, I mean, we are not uh, also so dumb, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we, 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 we will figure out, right? At least, you know, from our learnings, a little bit here, there, we will figure out, you know, where it's required, where it's not required. And, and more than figuring out, right, what it means is you, you, you need to build a relationship with your investors, right? Uh, and if that relationship is not built on reality and pragmatism and trust, and then that relationship is not going to work. So, so when you are pitching, you know, be honest, open, uh, be upfront about what are you trying to do? I mean, if you don't invest, it's fine. We can give some feedback. And if the problem is interesting, but you know, we may invest later, right? But at least being upfront, honest and truth in the pitches, right? Actually help us. And I've had like very difficult problem, I'll tell you, right? Founders, right? Having two different ideas or two startups at the same time. And you know, whichever gets money, I'll do that. You know, that's like horrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is like literally flabbergasting. Right? It has happened, you know, it's not like it's not happened. It has happened a few cases and I'm not saying, you know, everything, you know, it'll be like one in a hundred or, you know, two in a hundred cases, you know, that kind of a thing. Two ideas, you know, simultaneously saying, you know, whichever gets money, I'll invest. Oh, that's not working. Two, right, if you've not quit your company, right, uh, and, you know, you're telling me that I'll quit company, if you give me funding, boss, forget it. I'm not funding you. <laughs> well, you don't have skin in the game, you know, why do you expect me to put money, right? You quit, right, and come and, you know, do the startup if you're interested. Take that risk, right? Why should I take the risk of, you know, funding you, you know, uh, if you have not quit your company, right? Don't have a full-time job and tell me that, you know, I'll do that, you know, that doesn't work. I mean, these are not buzzwords, but these are scenarios I'm saying, you know, don't do, 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 don't do those things. Yeah. Also, right. Be cautious of, you know, giving away too much of your uh, uh, capital, too much of your capital or cap table to early investors, you know, if you don't know how the whole industry works. So there have been cases where, you know, people take a lot of founders, uh, uh, the company's equity for a very small sum. Later investors will find it very unattractive to actually invest. So you need to be careful about how much are you giving away. So if you give away a lot also, right, new investors will not come in because they don't see the future, frankly. It won't have a future is what they'll think. So you have to stay cautious in that. So uh, go to the right investors. Don't take money, you know, randomly, you know, just because, you know, somebody is willing to give money. So be careful about who you take your money from. You know, choose your investor. Just like investors are choosing you, you also choose your investor. Yeah. So, how important is financial education in India and what age should it start from? Do you mean this is a generic question on financial education in India? Uh, generic question and uh, for entrepreneurs as well. Look, for entrepreneurs, right, I think, you know, some ba basic uh, financials is absolutely essential. If they can get done with the basic course on, uh, you know, accounting or finance, right? I think, you know, that will serve them a lot, well, especially founders, right? I've seen so many cases of, you know, accounting mess up in early stages because, you know, I mean, you won't understand the difference between accrual model of accounting, you know, cash-based yeah. accounting, cash -based. you know, what model are you, cash -based. simple things, right? But you won't know. Either you outsource it very fast in your uh, life or uh, career uh, in the startup, uh, or, you know, learn a little bit, you know, so that, you know, you can be on top of it. See, at the end of the day, right, if you are going to be a CEO, right, at some point in time, you need to understand numbers. You need to know how to read a balance sheet. You need to know how to look at a p &L statement if you're a founder, right? So you might as well start early and figuring out what does that all those numbers mean, right? You can outsource, yes, after a point in time and, you know, somebody will give you the numbers, but good to know all those so that you can make those right. You know, financial education for founders are day one. Uh, or even before that, be ready with it, right? Financial education in India, man, look, that's like asking a very, asking a question to a politician, right? 
uh, it, it's a hard uh, uh, question if you ask hard in a sense look every i would say everybody should have financial education right but do people get right no no nah, i mean look at uh, what uh, we we teach people uh, uh, civics in school geography right yeah. we don't teach them life skills right so finance is a life skill uh, you know it has to be taught right you need to tell them you know uh, uh, how does money grow how mm-hmm. does how do you save money uh, right like if you put money in the bank right how does money grow in the bank money can multiply right i mean that's a concept which is alien to lot of kids or anybody right interest will come right like that's like multiplication right you talk about the compounding it has to be taught yaar yeah. i mean i'm like i'm saying you know it has to be done but i mean we don't have a mechanism right like we should we should put somewhere something there how to life skills are there you know so one of this is life skill also right for example how to communicate you know how to talk these are all life skills i think we focus so much on academics we don't teach people this or for that for that matter right even civic uh, responsibilities and duties right uh, in this country right so uh, these are life skills we have to teach you know anyway like finance is also one of the life skills which we has to be taught and then imagine you know that impact is going to be phenomenal right a lot of people hand over their finances to their father or to their spouses or to their husbands right you know that's that that is like a problem statement itself for some startup to do this <laughs> in a way how do you bring financial education to the entire masses and start from school yeah, i start from school and then their kids i feel yeah for example so, i should put a plug you plug in here right so zeroda uh, uh, as a set of books for kids on yeah. money and you know absolutely great book right first one i got for my daughter first time she realized you know money can grow money and like she was stunned that money can grow money when you put it in the bank so yeah. so so imagine right you know that means she's been thinking about money as something static so far like you know it's mm-hmm. like you give and take that's all it was it was for all her things right but now she realizes look money will grow you do something with it it will grow like a plant and you need to nurture it uh, you need to know how to you know do things with it right really <laughs> that has to be taught absolutely that's to be taught yeah so um just just going back to your approach of investing so you spoke about a, a market first uh, approach so in that case so how do you try and uh, of course it, it's not you mentioned information symmetry you may not be aware of everything but do you try and see the market in the lens of the founder or uh, is it uh, is it something else that you that you try and do to understand the market so look market has only one truth na Hmm. But is it the founder or is it me? It has only one truth. Who yeah. who has a better understanding of the market matters. That's all, right? That is where the question you have is it founder's perspective and you know my perspective. But the market truth is one, and market will show up its truth. Uh, if not today, tomorrow morning, or you know one year down the line. How much are you closer to the market truth is what matters, right? It's the same market for the founder and for me, right? My understanding, and you know? he has the same uh, game. so what will matter right uh, right given that the founder is playing in that market i would love to know if the founder can throw or you know show me more insights than i know on the market right for any market right like if obviously right he's spending his full time 24 hours on that particular market and i'm spending time on so many other things on markets his knowledge and can he throw me one two three insights in a call with me that is deeper insightful and that catches me by surprise saying you know look i didn't know this mm. right and that's the point of curiosity again i mentioned earlier right and and, mm. and i i would be like yeah this founder knows something more this founder has found the insights that means he spent time in the market so he has something more i need to talk to him a lot more and understand what's happening and you know that could be something that he can do that is where it comes down to but the truth of the market is one it will only show the truth eventually right yeah. Trace, uh, you have anything else? Uh, nothing else. I'm done. <laughs> awesome Thank guys. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Not. It was uh, it was really insightful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You got to learn a lot more than than what we already know. So, thank you. Always good, man. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again. Yeah. Thank nice. you. Have take care. Stay safe. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, man. Bye bye. Yeah. be interested in the angel investing course by the way we we looking forward to register there yeah yeah
when uh, when is the yeah, next yeah. Give us, uh, you can currently you can express your interest i think there is a google form yeah uh, okay uh, you can put it there uh, we are thinking we we'll launch it sometime end of june the reason we didn't launch right it, we didn't feel right that you know in the middle of a pandemic to launch an angel course it feels very insensitive sure. from some level you know with so much of things happening right we were like not very comfortable so we said uh, let's let it pass right you know so many people are struggling you know this is not the play point to launch something like uh, uh you know a course and market it right so we said let's wait it out let the situation improve and then when people have a little more peace and uh you know uh we can, we'll come back and launch you know when people will be a little more peaceful yeah we'll do that maybe end of june or you know beginning mid of june we'll try and uh, launch it yeah sure yeah look forward to it thank you yeah yeah thanks both of you see you guys thanks, thanks. bye thank you Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We have lots more to come on this channel since we have lined up a few more guests after this. Be sure to like, share and subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive updates. In the description below, I have provided the LinkedIn page link followers on LinkedIn to receive new notifications. So until next time, it's good.